Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Ruguru Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 283 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host Joey Coastman. I'm joined as ever now by the former heavyweight world title challenger, the main man himself, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how you doing my man? Uh, I'm doing good man. Doing good as I possibly can at this point and ready to keep it moving man. How about you? Stuff, man. I'm good, I'm good. I'm always good when speaking with you, Eddie, and I truly mean that. Uh, getting on to the review part of the show, we're going to start here at the Bolton White's Hotel in Bolton, United Kingdom. One or two fights to mention over here at MTK Global Show. Lewis Crocker with a win, a unanimous decision over 10 rounds for him. He's still 13-0. and 0. Well, he's now 13-0, and 0, of course. Uh, still undefeated is what I was uh, what I was meant to say. It was for the WBO European welterweight title against Denis Ilbaz, um, who is now 22 and three. Um, Ilbaz was down from a left uh, a left hand um, in the third round, if I'm not mistaken. Good win there for Lewis Crocker. Gary Cully now 12 and 0. He was able to TKO in two rounds. Victor Kotijagov. Now I'm starting to think Kotijagov perhaps isn't that good. He's the guy that Maxi Hughes upset, and now he loses here in two rounds to Gary Cully. So uh, yeah, perhaps he's not actually that good. Kotijagov now 12 and 2. It was for the vacant WBO European lightweight title. Taking nothing away from Gary Cully, by the way. Good win for him. Also on the card, friend of the show, Isaac Lowe. He's now 21 and 0 with three draws. A points win for him over six rounds against Ed Harrison. Uh, I think it might have been a late replacement, if I'm not mistaken. Ed Harrison now 2 and 6. Um, Isaac Lowe actually got cut as well from a head clash in round three. Moving out now to Australia, one fight to mention over here at the Bankstown City Paceway. One fight to mention, like I say, Ebony Bridges. She has won her fight. She's now 5-0, and oh, a unanimous decision over eight two-minute rounds against Carol Earl, who's now 3-4 and four with a draw. Again... This is a mouthful, but it was for it was for a title. The vacant Australian National Boxing Federation Australasian female super bantamweight title. In Ebony Bridges' next fight, she'll be coming to the UK and boxing Shannon Courtney for a world title. Yes, for a world title. Uh, moving out now to the Bendigo Stadium in Victoria, Australia. Over here, Blake Caparello, a guy they were lining up for Josh Buatzi as an opponent. Um, he lost. I don't know if it was a bit of an upset or not, but he lost unanimously over 10 rounds to Faris Chevalier, who's now 12 and 1. A unanimous decision, like I say, over 10 there for the WBA Oceana light heavyweight title. Faris Chevalier now 12 and 1. Maybe one to look out for there. And also on the card, Michael Zarafa, 27 and 4 going in, now 28 and 4. Um, he was able to knock out in just one round Anthony Mundine, who really should stay retired. He's now 48 and 11. Um, well, that's his 59th fight. Maybe he'll come back for, for the 60th, knowing him. It was for the vacant WBA Oceana middleweight title. Um, yeah, to get stopped in one round by Zarafa. There's no point continuing there. Moving out now to Thailand at the Workpoint Studio over here. Just one fight to mention. It took place, I think it was on the Friday. Um, with Saxel Wangek, also known as Srisaket Saw Rungvasai. A win for him. His opponent was quite terrible, to be honest. I can't believe his record was 50 wins, 7 losses, and a draw. He looked awful. He retired on his stall at the end of the third round. He didn't come out for round four. And Wangek now is in line, or he was in line, to fight the winner of Chocolatito and Estrada, which, of course, we're going to get onto. And he now becomes the mandatory, so he will box the winner, it, it would appear. Uh, moving out now to the Mohegan Sun Casino in Connecticut, USA. Uh, David Benavidez, friend 
end of the show. Now 24-0. and 0, A TKO in round 11 against Ronald Ellis, who's now 18 and uh, 2 with 2 draws. Um, good win there for Benavidez. I didn't actually see the fight, but I've, I've, I've heard a few things. Uh, apparently, he, he kind of turned the savage on around about the mid the midway point, Benavidez. And we know when he turns on that savage button, he's very exciting and he's very, very um, hard to beat. You know, he's, he's a brilliant fighter. One of the most exciting fighters, in my opinion, in world boxing. Also on the undercard there, um, Quadratilo Abdukokarov. He is now 18-0. and 0. His opponent, Javier Flores, retired on his stool after eight rounds. He's now 15-3. and 3. Um, So a good win for him. And the prospect, Jamonte Clark. He was 15-1 and 1 with a draw. He got in there against Terrell Gaucher, former, I think he's 2012 Olympian Gaucher. Uh, he was 21-2 and 2 with a draw going in. Now, Gaucher was actually the underdog here. Uh, which I found quite amusing. I thought that Gaucher was worth a sneaky little bet for a points win for Gaucher, but I was wrong. He was able to knock out in two rounds Jamonte Clark. Unbelievable. Um, big, big upset there to especially knock him out in two rounds. Gaucher not really noted as a puncher there, and I'm pleased for him because, like I said on last week's show, it's been stop-start. It's been hard to gain momentum for him. He had that fight with Eris Landy Lara. We had him on the show just before that. Since then, I haven't really reached out to get him back on because nothing's really happened unfortunately for him but hopefully he can build off of this and move on to something big because he's a really good fighter um moving out now to the american airline center in dallas texas usa over here we had um, i'm going to start with a main event actually and definitely this is going to be 2021 fight of the year juan francisco estrada 41 and 3 going in now 42 and 3 a little bit controversial actually in my opinion it ended um in a split decision over 12 rounds against roman gonzalez uh, chocolatito now 50 and 3 um it was for the wbc and wba super flyweight world titles can't remember which judge had which score, but like I say, a split decision, quite wide, I think on one card, uh, Carlos Sucre, that was the guy's name, who had it to Juan Francisco Estrada, um, I didn't bother actually scoring the fight, or noting stuff down, or anything like that, I just decided to sit back and watch it, um, you know, it was amazing how the fight lived up to the expectation, as we know, the rematches aren't as good um, as the first fight most of the time this was and it's not like you know this was like an instant immediate rematch there was I think eight years between the first fight and this fight here um, you know both guys at the top of their game even though most people thought Chocolatito was way past it and they managed to throw over 2,000 punches combined so it was just all action um, I actually thought Chocolatito might have nicked it but um yeah, I know you didn't see the fight, but no, great fight. Definitely, if you fancy watching back a twelve rounder, you you won't be uh, you won't be underwhelmed. It is, uh, you know, it's full of action. I just thought Roman Gonzalez just about outworked Estrada, but you know, it was a very very good fight. Those lighter weight fights, uh, really 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 busy. You know what I mean? And 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 they, if a lot of times, sometimes you get lost in it, and because they're you know so light, the punches aren't really. You know, it's not like um, like when I seen Nonino Donaire and guys like Victor Chinian who actually punch pretty hard at that weight, and you can actually see it and actually feel it. You know what I mean? When you when you watch it, it kind of you know it makes it interesting. But guys like Roman Gonzalez, who's not a bad puncher, I'm not saying he's not a puncher, and the smaller guys, those weights who don't really pack as much of punch as those guys kind of did, it makes it a little bit sometimes difficult to watch, even if the skills level is good, because it's almost like you're just, it's like you're watching two guys just, you know, basically hit the pads. I mean, I, I'm not saying hit the pads. You know what I mean? It's just not, it's not a lot going on as far as when you see guys getting hurt or whatever, and and you see the the punches actually, you know, the guys react to the punches as much. But um, if you say it, and I believe it, you know what I mean, that though that fight was exciting and you know just back and forth constantly through. Uh, through the 12 rounds, I'm definitely, definitely going to put that on my list to watch. Yeah, it will, it will, it will not disappoint. Also on the undercard, Hiroto Kayaguchi, now 15-0, and 0, a TKO for him in round five against Axel Vega, who's now 14-4 and 4 with a draw. Um, 
That was for Kaya Gucci's WBA Super Light Flyweight World title. Uh, Vega was unable to continue due to a hand injury. Uh, also on the card, Jessica McCaskill. Oh, man. Unbelievable. Now 10-2. and two, A unanimous decision over 10 two-minute rounds against Cecilia Brackhouse, who is now 36-2. and two. It was for the WBC, WBA, IBF, WBO and IBO female world titles. Now... It was just brilliant. Uh, really exciting first round. I felt like McCaskill was able to get inside on Brackhouse quite easily. McCaskill didn't jab at all. Everything was thrown with mean intentions. It was hooks galore. Uh, she landed a huge right hand on Brackhouse. Brackhouse walked right into that, that shot there. Uh, McCaskill rounding the first for me. Round two, very hard to split them. Um, a good start from Brackow. She was able to get the full leverage on her shots, which she failed to do properly in the first round. Uh, McCaskill finished strong. I was kind of edging towards a 10-10 for the second round there. Third round I gave to McCaskill. She was just able to get the better shots off. It was such an exciting fight at that point as well. Full of action. Um, a beautiful display for women's boxing, actually. Very good advert. Um... Round four, another round for McCaskill. She was just able to bully the bigger lady, which is really impressive. McCaskill uh, almost looks like, and I hope she doesn't mind me saying this, almost looks like a bit of a, dare I say, nerd outside of the ring. Um, you know, she, she looks like she works in a library. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And then when she gets in the ring, she just turns into a killer. She morphs into a killer. Um, it's almost like her and Gennady Golovkin have got that in common, where you look at these people and they don't look like uh, outrageous human beings. They look like very normal people. They are not normal at all. Looks can be deceiving. These people are beasts. Um, round five, getting back on track. Uh, close round in round five. Hard to split them. I must confess, I'm, I'm I'm a fan of the aggressive style. McCaskill is one of the most exciting fighters in women's boxing. I really like her style. Brackhouse boxed really well though in the fifth round. It was a really close one. I could probably edge towards another 10-10, and I hate to say that. Um, especially over two minutes, you know, it's, it's hard to split them sometimes. Round six, Brackhouse round for me. Uh, McCaskill was swinging and missing wildly. She was lunging in, uh, a little bit uncontrolled for the first time in the fight. Brackhouse was much more composed. She was picking the shots, uh, you know, the shots well. Um, round seven, I felt it was quite harsh from the referee to take a point away from Brackhouse for holding. Um, and it was sad because at that point... Um, you know, Brackhouse had, had had a couple of decent rounds in a row and yeah, it was it was kind of a shame because she was winning that round, then she loses the round 10-8. Uh, um, round 8, a close one, but I edged it to McCaskill based on a couple of better shots landed. Round 9, a quiet round, I edged it to McCaskill. Round 10, Brackhouse probably won that round just about. Uh, McCaskill was really tired at the end, but yeah, I'm pleased for... Jessica McCaskill because the first fight was a little bit controversial maybe that's the wrong word very very close and you you kind of thought to yourself just because it happened in in the US is that why she got the decision and I wanted a definitive decision this time and that is what we got she won the fight for me quite wide um classy stuff from Brackhouse as well she was clapping and smiling at the end when the when the scorecards were read out I think the scorecards were a little bit too wide one judge in particular didn't even give Brackhouse a round I don't think which is just disgusting um he had, he had it um 189 you know that's that's not right there um I think Brackhouse could be done there, um, in my opinion, but saying that she she did say she wants to fight on afterwards. Uh, I'm not sure how much money she's made in the sport, but she didn't, I don't think, ever really get that proper rivalry going, you know. I'm sure she was well paid for both of these fights here, but we never saw her box Clarissa Shields. We never saw her box Katie Taylor, even though there was a lot of talk about it, and it seems like they're they're not, you know, they're not fights that's going to be happening now. Uh, surely she's she's going to think about retirement soon. But no, brave effort, really classy. And like I say, for McCaskill to win even wider than last time, she's just improving all the time. She's so exciting, like I say. And she is an investment banker who goes straight back to work um, on the Monday after, after uh, retaining her undisputed titles at welterweight on the Saturday night, which <laughs> which says a lot about, about the lady's character. Um... Elsewhere on the card, we had Austin Williams move to 8-0, a unanimous decision over eight rounds against Dennis Duglin, who's now 22-8. and 
eight. Um, I'm a bit disappointed there in Duglin. I'm going to go through the rounds, actually. Uh, round one, Duglin was catching Williams with the lead right hook from that southpaw stance a couple of times. Ammo, Williams won the round for me pretty much based on the activity. The better shots, I think, were landed by Duglin. But again, for me, he was outworked. It was a really good opening round, though. Um, Duglin as well, he hit on the break with, with quite a big shot, actually, as well. He got told off from the referee for that in the first round. Uh, round two, Duglin was taking more more and more clean shots. It was a big round for Ammo Williams. He he also hit Duglin with a big straight left and it knocked the gum shield out of Duglin's mouth. Williams for the first two rounds had been targeting the body of Duglin pretty much exclusively. Um, a great thing to do to a fighter who hasn't had too much notice for the fight. Round three, another good round for Williams. Uh, Duglin got caught with a big body shot and he buckled back onto the ropes. Williams went in for the kill. He tried to finish Duglin with, with a barrage of punches that I don't think had much power on them. It was more like when you're trying to get the referee to jump in, he threw about 100 shots um, <laughs> like a you know, like an automatic weapon or something. Brrr. Um <laughs> but yeah, Duglin wasn't ready to go and he, he actually countered with a couple of beautiful shots off the ropes himself, but another round there for Williams. Uh, Williams as well, I gave the fourth round. The fifth round, I actually gave to Duglin. Williams got hurt with a shot. It was a lead straight left hand. Uh, Duglin was on Williams' chest. Williams looked tired. He didn't have the, the pop on his punches at that point. Duglin was up in the pace and for me, Won the round clearly, although Chris Mannix disagreed, which I, you know, that, that doesn't really deter me from my thoughts because Chris Mannix has some outlandish thoughts sometimes, I think. Um, round six, Williams caught Duglin with a huge right uppercut. Duglin finished the round really strong, though. Uh, really good and interesting fight, I felt, through the first six rounds. And you just knew that Williams would be learning so much from this, really learning on the job in the fight. Round seven, a round that Duglin was winning for me, or the round was maybe hanging in the balance. About one minute to go is when Duglin got caught with a huge right hand and it buckled him into the ropes. Uh, some referees, I think, would have even stopped it at that point, but he did manage to stay up and regroup, but all in all, a big round for Williams again. And then round eight, another round for Williams. Not much in it. Um, you know, I was disappointed all in all, considering my scorecard was seven rounds to one in favour of Williams. I think Duglin should have been able to do more. I think the scorecards didn't exactly tell the story of the fight, but I still expected more from Dennis Duglin, who's a friend of mine. Um, you know, I thought he could pose a few more problems than what he did. He told me he was in shape for the fight. Um, he just couldn't, he just, I don't know, he just couldn't put it together. But that was that. Also on the card, Solomon Sissoko with a win, a TKO in six rounds over Daniel Echeverria, who I think was a really late addition. Um, Sissoko now 12-0. and 0, And also the undefeated prospect, Raymond Ford, 8-0. and 0. He got in there with the undefeated 10-0, and 0, Aaron Perez, and it ended in a split draw over eight rounds there. So... Bit of a bump in the road for Raymond Ford. Anyway, that is it, though, for the review part of the show. Just before we wrap up part one, the final thing to do is to welcome our sole guest on this week's podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former WBA super lightweight world champion and one of my favorite boxers in the world. It is, of course, Mr. Regis Progre. Regis, welcome back on the show, my man. You know how it works by now. <laughs> Of course, bro. Thank you, brother. Thanks for having me, bro. Always a pleasure, Regis. It truly is. So we last spoke back in October. It was just before your fight against the undefeated Juan Geraldez. Uh, you knocked him out, <laughs> and then you rushed off to be there for your wife, who had just given birth. You ended up missing the Javante Davis KO of the year against Santa Cruz. <laughs> How is everything, yeah. man? The no, baby no, no. Okay? I was there. I was there. No, no, no. Okay. I was there, bro. I was there. I stayed around. I, so I left... Um. I left like six o'clock that morning, you know, cause so I live in Katy, Texas and San Antonio is, it's probably like two hours away, bro, in the car. So right on I-10. So you no, know, I stay, I watched the, I watched the KO in my dressing room of, um, yeah, of, of Davis. And then after that, you know, my, all my, my family and stuff, they had like, um, hotels and Airbnbs and my friends, they was all came from New Orleans. They always come support. So, um, yeah, we, I went out there, hung with them for a little while. I I, I kind of like took a little nap on their sofa, and then um then I just I headed out and um yeah I headed out like I left like six o'clock that morning and um but and then I made it I made it for the baby. Oh, brilliant man, brilliant. Baby's okay, family's good. 
Yeah, bro, baby's all right. She's she's four months now, bro. So, yeah, she's four months old now. That's crazy. Beautiful stuff, man. Um, on to what's happening next. You're boxing April 17th against Ivan Redcatch as part of Triller's Jake Paul versus Ben Askren undercard. Firstly, Regis, right. how did this opportunity present itself to you? Obviously, Triller's really new in boxing. Um, They just, I mean, my manager hit me up about it. He was like, bro, you know, like, so, you know, I'm still, I still want to do the whole Al Heyman PBC thing. So that was kind of, that was kind of the route I'm going in. I'm still going that way, you know, so, um, but that deal is still getting, you know, it's it's kind of getting worked out and all that stuff. And um, they came up, they, I guess my manager just found out about it. They asked my manager about it. And it was like, what you think about it? And I was like, man, you know, like, you know, I still, I definitely still want to deal with Al Heyman, but, you know, see what Al thinks about it. And Al was cool with it. Al was like, yeah, that's fine. Like, we, he could do that, you know. And then by the time this is over, you know, the, the whole PBC thing, the deal should be going on or whatever, you know, it should be into play or whatever. And um, so, and that's how it came about. And it was like, yeah, go ahead, take that fight. And, you know, and that's, that's what happened. <laughs> And yeah, I was going to ask if the Triller thing was was like a long term thing or like a one fight thing. It seems like it's it's, it's a short term thing. That's fine. Um, I'm sure mm -hmm. there will be a lot of eyes tuned in around the world for this fight here. Um, how do you kind of sum up Red Catch? I guess he's a tough guy. He's been in with a good list of names. He pulled off that upset win over Devin Alexander a while back. But is this a mm -hmm. kind of fight that that gets you excited, Regis, or not? I mean, for me, of course, you know. I mean, all fights get me excited, bro. I don't, I don't take nobody lightly. You know what I'm saying? Like that. For me, it's just, um, ever, especially ever since I moved back to Texas, bro. Like, um, I just been training. I've been training like a madman. I don't know. Like my my training just stepped up all the way. I'm more serious about it. Um, you know, like I never really lived like a fighter, to be honest. You know, I was, I became a world champion, not even living like a. Uh, a world class fighter, you know, my trainers will always tell me, man, you got to live like this. And I never really did it, you know. And then, um, but now, you know, the Haraldez fight, you know, that was like my first time in camp. I was super, super focused and um, I just lived like a fighter, basically. And what I mean by that is like, you know, I go to, of course, I go to the gym and work out every day. But when I come home, you know, it's, it's no bullshit. I come home, you know, I eat, you know, I play with my kids a little bit. Then I just, I take a nap, you know, and then I wake up and then I, I you know, I maybe run a few errands or whatever I got to do personally. And, and then I, I work out again. You know, I, I actually just finished training at 815, you know, so and to, tonight is like a short night for me, you know. So last night we finished, we finished working out probably like two hours later, like 1030 or something like that, you know. So, um, so yeah, bro, that's, you know, that's just kind of, you know, I mean, I think I kind of got off subject, but yeah, that's kind of why I'm at with it. Yeah, you can do what you want on this podcast, my friend. <laughs> but anyway, the mega fight in your division has been announced. Josh Taylor, Jose Ramirez for all the belts, May 22nd. We had Maurice Hooker mm. on the show last week. He's he's uh, picking picking Josh Taylor, even though he said it'll be interesting to see Taylor deal with uh, Ramirez's pressure. Who have you got winning that one? Right. I got, I still got Josh Taylor, bro. I mean, I think he's superior but you know what like since everybody is picking to I, I i haven't ran across nobody yet that says ramirez is gonna win that fight you know and that that could be kind of scary you know like everybody's picking josh taylor win, and you know maybe josh taylor's hearing the same thing and you know maybe he's getting you know i mean i don't think he's getting lackadacious in his training or nothing like that but you just never know you know it's more motivation for jose ramirez so um, I still think Josh Taylor should win, you know, skill wise. Like I said, man, Jose's been, you know, he's been outboxed and, you know, a, a few times already. And, you know, he has trouble with southpaws. Everybody knows that he had trouble with southpaws and boxes, you know, and Josh Taylor could be both of them. So, and then he has power. So it could be a nightmare for Ramirez. But at the same time, man, Ramirez is not going to stop coming, you know. So Josh Taylor has to fight a smart fight. And he has to be on his P's and Q's the whole time. And, you know, um, but I still think he, you know, he should be able to pull it off. And, of course, there's talk of Javante moving up to 140. Now, I'm not going to reveal any names, but I know a guy who was part of his camp and he didn't even really want Javante up at 135, let alone 140. Do you think him moving to 140, giving away his physical advantages, is a big mistake if Javante is attempting to emulate Floyd Mayweather and try and stay undefeated for a long period of time? You know what? I think he can beat some of the people, but he's not going to be, he's not, he, he can't mess with somebody like me, Ramirez, Taylor, you know, it's all big, strong 40 pounders, you know, even like Zapata, 
um, even like a uh, maybe like a, even a Baranchek or something like that, like strong 140 pounders. You know, like he's he's you know he's good. He has power, but I don't think that power is gonna is gonna move up with him to 140. I just I just don't see it. You know, like I said, you know he he he's strong. He's a strong little guy, but man, it, they make weight classes for a reason. And I just don't think that power is gonna be able to. It, I don't think he's gonna be able to carry that power. You know, and then. Because these dudes, you know, at 40, we're bigger, we're stronger, and we have stronger chins, you know, especially somebody like me. Uh, I, I mean, I know he was, you know, saying shit about me and all that type of stuff, but, bro, he just, I think he's just too small, you know. So I don't think that, you know, I think I think he might go ahead and grab that belt from Barrios. I'm not going to lie. I really think he could beat Barrios, you know. I, I, I don't I don't see if he's going to fight Barrios for sure. I think he'll, I, I really think he'll be able to beat Barrios for that belt, but, you know, every anybody else, bro, I just don't see it. Damn. And and tell me, Regis, you've spoke about obviously Javante, you've spoke about fighting Taylor again, you've spoke about fighting Ramirez for a long time, Adrian Broner. Is there anyone else that's kind of on your hit list? I love all these fights, man. Um, I think somebody else is like a Robert Easton. You know, I think Ooh. he's moving he moved up to one forty. So I think that could be an interesting fight also. Somebody like Robert Easton, you know, like I mean I've been calling Adrian Brown to fight off for a long time, but I, I don't think he's gonna take that fight, you know, um, especially no time soon. You know, I think I need to build my profile more and um, you know, then he's gonna be forced into it, you know. But like right now it's 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 crazy, but like right now it's a lot of people you know, every time they, they ask him about something, they say my name. They say Regis Program. And every time they ask me, they say Adrian Broner. So I think the fans, the true boxing fans, they do want to see that fight right now. Um, so I think it, it it's a it's a possibility that it could happen. But, you know, I'll, we'll, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Who do you want most out of all those names, man? Adrian Broner. <laughs> yeah, I think Adrian Broner. Yeah, Adrian Broner. I've been wanting him, bro. I've been wanting Adrian Broner for years and years and years. So, yeah, Adrian Brown is like, I think that's the fight that will really give me the exposure I deserve, you know? I mean, I, like, bro, I was already a world champion, and, you know, I have high, like, a high knockout percentage rate. And, you know, probably one of the, if I'm not mistaken, like, one of the best in my division. And, um, you know, people still really don't, people still, like, as far as, like, outside of boxing, they still don't really know who I am, you know? So, I think that somebody like him, you know, I would um I would really get the exposure that, you know, that I deserve beating somebody like Adrian Brown. Yeah, man, there's so many fights up that I would love to see. I mean, 140 even though we're getting like the 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 undisputed fight happening and we're all we're all in favor of that happening, but the guys just underneath that that don't hold a belt right now. There's so many wicked fights, man. Like I say, you, yourself, Baranchik, Zapida, Barrios, um yeah, Broner if he's at 140, um Javonte if he comes up, like you said as well, Easter, he's only got the loss to to Mikey Garcia. It's, it's such a brilliant division even though none of the guys I've mentioned are actual well aside from Barrios quote unquote belt right. holders know, you know what I'm saying none of them 40s. right no no we're in real 40s yeah. you know so yeah. beautiful stuff man and it's been agreed that the big heavyweight unification is going to be taking place hopefully we get a venue soon but um, they've agreed to a two fight deal Regis Fury Joshua Joshua Fury whichever way round you want it who will win in your mind my friend I got Fury, man. I got Tyson Fury. You know, I just think, you know, it, I think that's a it's it's a hard fight. I really think that's a fifty fifty fight. I mean, I, I just favor Fury just a little more, but I definitely think that's a fifty fifty fight, bro. So, um, but I just favor Fury a little more, man, just because how big he is. He can definitely take a punch. I mean, Dante Wilder is actually one of the hardest hitting heavyweights of all time. Looking at his record, you know, so, um, and he got up from that shit so twice. So it's just like I think that um. I think Fury, bro. I think he could take the punch and he can box. He's a big man as long as he stays focused. You know, like that's the only thing. You know, I think with with Tyson Fury, you know, maybe you know he has like um, outside ring activities that you know that might not be too good. And so, but I don't know. I don't know him personally, nothing like that. But um, I still think, yeah, I think Fury should be able to outbox him and stuff. We shall see. We shall see. But just finally, Regis, man, if you've got any closing words, I always ask you this. Unite yourself. You've got a hell of a uh, a fan base over here that love and support you, man. What's your message to those guys? Uh, man, I just, I just thank y'all, man. I love the UK, of course. And hopefully I can come back and fight. You know, I come back over there and fight. You know, um, 
I don't think they got anybody for me right now. You know, um, I, I think we was calling out the wrestling fight, and, you know, that's not going to happen or nothing like that. He already said it himself. So, um, yeah, I love y'all guys. and Hopefully, just tune in, you know, April 17th, tune in live on Triller. And, um, you know, and, and, and watch me do my thing again. Absolutely. April 17th. Listen, Marie, just man, it's always great speaking with you. It's always uplifting. I think speaking with you is the right word. Thanks for your time. Best of luck for April 17th, and we'll catch up sometime after. All right, bro. Thank you. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. Uh, the first piece of news that we're going to speak about here is the fact that Arta Baturbiev against Adam Danes, which is taking place this weekend, that um, is actually uh, going to be on Box Nation for anyone in the UK that is listening, that subscribes to that channel, um, which at the minute is kind of uncool to subscribe to them because their boxing content has been so few and far between. But some people don't know that if you're subscribed to BT Sport, you get Box Nation as part of the package for free. Um, and when I say some people don't know, I literally mean my dad was subscribed to BT Sports and he was also paying monthly for Box Nation and he had no idea that he was paying for no reason for Box Nation because it comes free. So don't get caught out on that. But that's a big fight there. Um, I'll find a way of watching that for sure because that's a good fight. We will talk about uh at the preview point. Also, we have, like I said earlier on, Shannon Courtney to, to take on Ebony Bridges for the WBA uh, Bantamweight World Title, the vacant title. It's going to be taking place on Saturday, April the 10th, um, on the Zone and on the Sky. Um, Murajon Akhmadaliev, that's the guy who beat Daniel Roman. He returns to action uh, in... Uzbekistan, actually. He takes on... Um, oh, what's the guy's name? Um, J- Japanese fighter he is. Um, Iwasa. He's taken on Iwasa. I uh, can't remember the guy's record, but really good fighter as well. That's going to be on April 3rd. And the undercard is quite decent as well, so check that one out. Um, April 24th, Emmanuel Navarrete takes on Christopher Diaz and Edgar Balanga takes on Demond Nicholson. That's going to be on ESPN there. Um, what else do we have? We have our oh, brilliant fight that's been announced as well for the WBO middleweight world title. Demetrius Andrade takes on Britain's very own Liam Williams at the Hard Rock, um, the Hard Rock in Hard Rock, the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Hollywood, Florida. April 17th is the date. Really looking forward to that one. A lot of Americans underestimating Liam Williams. Believe me, that's going to be a really, really good fight. And the final piece of news, it's a little bit, well, it's a big, I was going to say it's a little bit sad. It's a big bit sad. Um, We've lost a boxing legend. And, you know, legend is almost like a word that gets thrown around too much. But this guy, you know really was a boxing legend um eddie i'm sure you know being older than me you'll be able to remember him kind of more than i did but um marvin Hagler, man one of the very best obviously one of the uh the the fantastic four um tremendous fighter man really you know very exciting absolutely live for boxing i think you know you speak about um you know those other guys in the Fantastic Four, like Roberto Duran, he's, he's a national treasure, you know, a Panamanian national treasure. You, you you talk about Sugar Ray Leonard, obviously, you know, almost like a darling of US boxing. And um, I think kind of with with uh, Marvin and with um, with Tommy Hearns, I feel like they're the two that kind of don't get the accolades that the other two did. But Marvin probably even less than Tommy Hearns. So unfortunately, I don't think he, he did get the credit, but I don't think. He, he was kind of, I don't know, especially from a UK point of view, I don't think he was on the same wavelength as those guys in terms of popularity, even though he deserved it. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate, man. You have fighters like that that come through that just do the work, you know what I mean? Like, you know, Bernard Hopkins gets, you know, he gets a good amount of credit now, but Bernard Hopkins was that workman like guy, man, you know what I mean? It, probably one of the greatest middleweights of all time type thing, too. But, you know, when you look at and you remember and people talk about, you know, you hear De La Hoya mostly, you know what I mean? Even and he was a little bit lighter and it went up to fight Bernard. But those are the guys that get the credit. You know, you hear more like, you know, just the popular guys, the the, the, 
the the friend the the fan friendly. Not saying that Bernard wasn't fan friendly at times, but his style was made to win. You know what I mean? So you don't really hear as much. I mean, he's like I said, he's popular. We know him. He's a legend. But you know, it's just it's similar to that when you look at Marvin Hagler. Marvin Hagler was that kind of guy. You know what I mean? He would go in, win the fight. Wasn't real loud. Wasn't all you know flashy and all that. He just had the skills and 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 the toughness to 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 win. You know what I mean? Like it's funny when you when you watch him when he got in there with uh, with uh, with Tommy Hearns. Tommy Hearns can knock anything out, and he was just like, man, if Tommy hit him with that big right hand and all that, man, he hit him with several big shots, and I didn't see him back up one step. And it's just like, damn, man, this guy was a legitimate monster. Man, he was he's, he's a legend for a reason. You know what I mean? The, the dude was uh, he was special. Yeah, and he also had some great quotes, and I'm going to read out two of my favorite quotes. One that I really love, and it rings so true in boxing, is that you know he, he once said, "It's tough to get out of bed to do road work at 5 a.m. when you've been sleeping in silk pajamas." I love that one. <laughs> And, um, and and yeah. this other one which I'm not sure you will know Eddie but if you do then great if you don't then it'll make you laugh I'm sure and he once said if they cut my bald head open they will find one big boxing glove that's all I am I live it <laughs> yeah no doubt I... <laughs> well that's crazy but so, hey yeah, that's the truth too probably he lived it yeah no yeah. brain in there just a big boxing glove just a glove, glove. Just a, he ready to punch that glove would probably punch you in the face too, huh? <laughs> but there we go. Rest in peace, Marvin. Um, a tremendous fighter and a real true boxing legend. Um, it's been great hearing the boxing all over the world the past weekend, ringing out the the ten bells. Um, yeah, what a legend! And um, he'll be missed. He'll be missed. Uh, Sixty six years of age. Marvellous Marvin Hagler. Rest in peace, my friend. Moving on now to the preview part of the show. We're going to start here in India, which we don't often do. Um, over here, we have Vijenda Singh, the part-time boxer, part-time actor. Uh, he's a Bollywood actor and part-time, I think, I'm not sure if he's still doing it, but at one stage, he was a policeman over there. He's 12-0. and 0. He's in an eight-rounder against Artsai Lopsan, who's 4-1 and one with a draw. That's over eight rounds there. Not sure what Vijenda Singh's doing. He's got to be up there in age now. He needs to get going. Um, we have at the Bolton Whites Hotel, this one's on Friday, um, Karim Gwerfi, it's finally on, I think it's probably the second or third time this fight's been on, 29-4, and four, he takes on Lee McGregor, 9-0 and oh for the EBU European Bantamweight title, Maxi Hughes, 22-5 and five with two draws, can he continue that momentum that he gathered in 2020, in 2021? It's a great fight here for the vacant British lightweight title against Paul Hyland Jr., 20-2. and two. It's a winnable fight for Maxi Hughes. I really, really like that fight there. Um, moving out now to Russia, like we said, it's on Box Nation for those listening in the UK. On the undercard, Igor McCorkin, 23-2, and two, former opponent of, of um, Sergei Kovalev. He was supposed to be boxing um, Callum Johnson, but for whatever reason, that fight just seems like it like it's never going to happen now and Callum Johnson's left Eddie Hearn and he's he's joined Frank Warren anyway McCorkin is in an eight rounder against Dennis Sayuk who is 12 and 4 uh, McCorkin as well I should mention beat Baturbiev in the amateurs as well I think more than once and talking of the big man, Arta Baturbia, 15 and 0, defends his WBC and IBF World Light Heavyweight titles against Adam Danes, who's 19 and 1 with a draw. This again is a fight that's been um, rescheduled a bunch of times. I think it's been put off with COVID and stuff like that. But um, he's a decent fighter. His one loss came to Fan Long Meng, who is a Chinese fighter who's undefeated, who once upon a time beat Frank Buglioni in Monaco. And he's quite good, Fan Long Meng. So still not quite sure how good Adam Danes is. Uh, he's actually, he was born in Russia, but he lives in Germany. So it's not like so much that he's going to be the away fighter, I wouldn't have thought. It seems like, you know, if you're born in Russia, it's a big fight, I'm guessing, over there. Um... Moving out now to the Dickies Arena in Fort Worth, Texas, USA. Over here, 
we have the knockout machine, Virgil Ortiz Jr., 16-0 with 16 KOs. It's for the vacant WBO international welterweight title. He takes on a man stepping up in weight, and this man was on the show last week. It is, of course, Maurice Mighty Mo Hooker, 27-1 with three draws. That one loss came to Jose Ramirez. He's stepping up. He's joined camps with Terence Crawford and Jamil Herring. He seems a bit rejuvenated. I really liked his att- his attitude on, on last week's show. He says that he's going to go in there, and he actually feels like knocking uh, Ortiz out would be easier than beating him on points. It is a golden boy show. It's on the zone. Really looking forward to that. I hope he can pull off the win, because he's now a friend of the show, and I always back friends of the show no matter what. But um, Virgil Ortiz does look quite special. So I'm really excited for that one. Also on the undercard, Annabelle Ortiz, 31 and 3. She's the WBA World Female Minimum Weight Champion. She takes on Sinisa Estrada, um, who is, who is um, you know, a lady that a lot of people are behind. Over 10 two-minute rounds. Estrada actually going down in weight. I think she's normally a light flyweight. She's gone down to minimum weight there. Estrada really can fight as well, it seems. Like, she's, you know, she's got a lot of fans for reasons beyond boxing. I think a lot of people find her extremely attractive. However, she really can fight. I'm not saying Ebony Bridges can't, but she really can fight. She knocked that lady out in about five seconds in 2020. It was a bit of a joke fight, to be honest, but this will be interesting. This really is a big fight. There, that's on the undercard. Um, And the final card we're going to mention here takes place at the Wembley Arena in London. Over here we have on the bill, I'm going to run through it, uh, two ladies fighting on the bill. We have Ellie Scottney, 1-0. and oh. She's in a six two-minute round contest against Maylies Gangloff, who's 4-1. and one. Ramla Ali, 1-0 oh, in a six two-minute round contest against Beck Connolly. Uh, Joe Caldina, the, the uh, 2016 Olympian, in a 10-rounder against Farouk Korbanov, who's 17-2. and two. Anthony Fowler, 13-1, and one, another, um, another Olympian from 2016. He... Puts his WBA international super welterweight title on the line against Jorge Fortea, who's 21 and 2 with a draw. Chris Willem Smith, 11 and 1 for the vacant WBA continental cruiserweight title. He takes on Vasil Dukar, who's 9 and 3 with a draw. Chris Willem Smith, I'm sure he was supposed to be taking on Dion Juma, and this is the first I'm reading about it. That fight obviously must have fallen through, which is a big shame because I was really looking forward to that one. And the main event itself, Lawrence Akoli. Another man from the 2016 Olympic Games, 15 and 0. He fights for the vacant WBO Cruiserweight World Title against Christoph Glowacki, who's 31 and 2 over 12 rounds, of course. Uh, Glowacki is a man who is vastly experienced, being a former world champion himself, um, holding that exact belt, the WBO World Title. I remember him losing the belt and losing his O on the same night to Usyk on points back in 2016 when Usyk travelled out to Poland and beat him in front of his own fans. But he's a really, really good fighter. Um, he's coming off a loss, which isn't ideal, but his loss came to Maris Bradis. And if you remember that fight, Maris Bradis, in my opinion, probably should have got disqualified. He hit him while he was down. He seemed like he didn't recover. It was very messy. I don't think we should read too much into that. But he's, he's a really seasoned fighter, Glowacki. He seems really up for this. Um, he, he's only six foot tall, so he's not a massive cruiserweight. However, he is a southpaw. Lawrence Sokoli is a massive cruiserweight, and he can punch like heck. So it's it's a really, really interesting clash of styles here. But um, he's got good wins, Glowacki, you know, against guys like Maxim Vlasov and a bunch of other guys. Steve Cunningham, Marco Huck. You know, he's beaten all these guys. So he is quite seasoned, and I think it's a big step up here for Lawrence Sokoli, who I hope comes through it. But I tell you what... I'm going to look at the odds on this because this is an interesting fight for me. I think that if I, I could be tempted in, into putting a small little amount on the underdog here, the former world champion, who's only lost to the two best guys at Cruiserweight, Usyk, who's no longer at Cruiserweight, and Bradis, who um, went on to win the World Boxing Super Series. So this is a mega fight here. And is it a bit too soon for Lawrence Okoli? We're going to find out. I'm really excited for the fight. Um, but anyway, that's about it. That's all the talking done. That's the review part done. 
The sole guest made an appearance, the former 140 world champion Regis Progray. We've brought you the news and we've just completed the preview part of the show. The final thing to do is for me to come in with the outro in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 283 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A massive thank you to our sole guest on this week's podcast, the former WBA super lightweight world champion, Regis Progre. The biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners, for tuning in once again this week. There has been a few pieces of news break whilst we've been recording the show. On April 24th, we're going to get to see an excellent fight between two unbeaten fighters when the British middleweight champion Denzel Bentley takes on the Commonwealth middleweight champion Felix Cash. Somebody's O must go. Again, that's April 24th. The week before that, April 17th, MTK Global are putting on a show that will be headlined by Danny Dignam against former John Ryder opponent Russia's Andre Sorokin. That's a really tough fight there for Dignam. Really looking forward to that. And it's got a good undercard, which features Joe Hamm against Jack Bateson and Dan Aziz against Ricky Summers. Really good fights there. Uh, Really looking forward to that one. Again, April 17th, that will be taking place in Bolton. And the week before that, April the 10th, it's like I'm doing this in reverse order, it would seem here. It's been rescheduled, thankfully, the WBO light heavyweight world title fight between Joe Smith Jr. and Maxim Vlasov. That fight takes place now in Oklahoma. Come on, Joe Smith. But that's about everything from myself. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe, and we shall see you all again next week.